You are watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. So, uh, greetings to all of you. Greetings to everyone that is connecting. As you can see, our Professor Baba Molebi K. Asante is sitting comfortably in his studio. Baba, I welcome you tonight. It's been a pleasure for almost, I mean, the first name that we had on our list when we launched the Pan African Daily one and a half years ago was your name. And we kept oh, reaching out reaching out our hearts have been so filled up so we're so happy to have you here today and uh this is the right time i think uh, we've had all sort of professors came here and have you reached out to Baba asante have you reached out to professor asante all mm -hmm. everyone has mm -hmm. been asking so we're so happy that you're here tonight and um we want to talk about uh, this uh this idea of you know Afrocentricism, like mm -hmm. we call it, the Africanness, the mind, mm -hmm. the spirit, the body, the everything. But mm -hmm. we want to refer it with the significance of the hit Black uh, History Month. And we are commemorating this week for late ancestor Malcolm X. So we call it the Malcolm X Week. And uh, we have to get some professors, teachers like you come up to educate us on the principles on which he left, uh, I mean, he lived and sacrificed all his entire life for the unity of the African. So how can we achieve that when we commemorate and we meet on this week, when we remember him, what are the ideologies, what are the values that he left behind? And what is it that you as the professors or our teachers or our elders want us to know and should be learning, particularly for the young, the younger generation. I'm not really in that. I'm in the middle age also. And so it's really a wonderful pleasure, Baba. Good evening to you out there. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you very much. I'm really delighted to be on your show, Dr. Tata. Always happy to see you and hear about your work. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, today, we want to talk about this topic, which we thought it only you, um, all the professors or elders and teachers have been talking about it, but because your work actually is centered on this, we, we said we should be studying more to talk about things that unite us than the ones that break us. And we should focus on our Africanness and the essence of us knowing who we are, where we come from, how were we before pre-colonial history? What is it that happened through this disconnect and how should we go on? So the topic today is Afrocentricity, African politics, unity, and the significance of the Black History Month. Over to you, Baba. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me just start by saying that it's, I, I'm so happy to be on your, on your program. <laughs> and I just uh, earlier today, uh, was on another Zoom from South Africa. And they're all, you know, you, you, these days I'm just Zoomed out, you know, and it's just <laughs> Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. But yes. this, thing, this, uh, 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 view, this uh, program from South Africa was actually an interview and conversation with one of the leading uh, African uh, Afrocentrists, a uh, brother by the name of Dr. Lehasa Malloy, who is at uh, hmm. University of South Africa. And we were just having this conversation about, you know, what is the meaning uh, of Afrocentricity for today? And what, how, how do we articulate it? And how do we try to show people what it is? And he was telling me that he was talking to some colleagues and uh, they were talking about how they need to examine certain ideas that were coming out of Europe and out of Asia. And he asked them a simple question. Have you ever thought about 
examining ideas that come from your own village. Correct. What about ideas that come from your own clan? Mm. What, what about ideas that are really developed from an African point of view so you can see how that fits into the larger world? Mm. And it was a profound uh, question that he asked them because they'd never thought about it. Uh, they thought that if you want to study agriculture, you got to go to European writers. If, if you're interested in studying about the environment, you've got to look at what the Americans have written. Uh, mm -hmm. But hey, wait a minute, haven't Africans been involved in these questions? So Afrocentricity is the idea that African people must view themselves and be viewed as subjects of narratives, subjects of phenomena. We're, we're not on the margins looking in, we are ourselves actors. We are ourselves uh, people who are making history. We, we're not just observing other people. But mm. the way the world has structured it, it seems like Africans are always going to get something which is already at home. And so we mm. never interrogate from our own point of view. So Afrocentricity is making yourself, making African ideas, African cultural values, centering them. If you ask me to questions about uh, the concepts of beauty or philosophy, concepts of art, the first question that I have is what did our people think? What are the values that come out of the African experience? There's nothing more correct for us. I often say this than our own historical experiences. We can have other historical experiences. We can study other people. We can examine other ideas, but what about your own ideas? And what has happened to us since the great war on Africa, beginning in 1807 with the end of the enslavement on the, uh, the, the, slave, the European slave trade, what has happened to us is that we essentially have been totally dislocated from our own mm -hmm. center. We're, mm -hmm. we're not on our own terms. We don't uh, express ourselves in terms of our aesthetics uh, often. Uh, we don't express ourselves in terms of our names. We don't express ourselves in terms of our ancestors. In fact, we honor the ancestors of other people more than we honor ours. And Absolutely. the names of our own ancestors have not been heard, you see? So that's, so, so, so Afrocentricity is about that. It's about recentering, relocating, coming to a point where we can assert what is uh, culturally uh, valuable from an African point of view. And, and we examine things that way. We, uh, we, we make analysis. Uh, uh, we, 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 if we prophesy, we prophesy on the basis of those values. Uh, we, we are centered uh, within a universe where many things happen. But we as actors in the universe must also in qu question ourselves. What, what are our actions? What, we do, what do we do in this situation? In, in the United States, and you're talking about Black History Month, I was in uh, New Orleans and I asked a group of school teachers in New Orleans, I said, um, uh, name me 10 things that African-Americans did in history. And when I got the list, uh, many of the things that they identified were not things that, that we did, they were things that happened to us. You know, someone said the Emancipation Proclamation. So well, what role do we play in that? So the question for me always is where is our agency? What do we do? How have we achieved? What kinds of things are structured in the world that make an African, an African person? Well, mm -hmm. why, why are we always taking on the clothes of uh, the European or the Arab or uh, some some other thing other than interrogating ourselves. I mean, the first thing you ought to do is interrogate yourself. And once you interrogate yourself, then you can you know you can say you know I'm a free person. I I I, I don't like it myself. I don't like what I do. I'm gonna choose something else. But you have never interrogated yourself, so you don't even know whether you like yourself or not. Mm. So so these are the principal kinds of ways that I look at uh, phenomena, look at the world, and try to raise uh, questions about how we move in, in, in the world, you see. Hmm. Um, this is quite interesting and um, also uh, 
provocating because yeah. I, for instance, I come, I'm a village girl. Good. And exactly, this is the point where you, things that when I, when I came here, I saw, it was like, is it somewhere else or actually what I know? And um, do you think, Prof, like we've been saying, every other person has been saying, can we actually as Africans be Afrocentric without knowledge of our history? I mean, when I mean our history, pre-colonial history. You have asked a very profound question. Uh, and the answer is that knowledge of history is itself the basis for African consciousness. And so mm -hmm. the question, the answer to that is that we can have Africanity without our knowledge. In other words, we can, we can practice the rituals, we can wear the clothes, uh, we can mm -hmm. cook in certain ways, we can have Africanity. But yes. Afrocentricity is consciousness. And we cannot necessarily have full consciousness unless we have knowledge. Because if we don't have knowledge, we, we, we have no idea that we are the mothers and fathers of the universe. That, mm. the, that Homo sapiens start on the continent of Africa. Everything should start there. We, we are the original humans. Homo sapiens did not start in Asia or Europe or America. Homo sapiens started in Africa. And we spent three fourths of the time that Homo sapiens have been on the earth. We spent three fourths of that time in Africa before mm. we before we ever migrated out of Africa. And the migration out of Africa happened seventy thousand years ago. But we had already spent over two hundred thousand years in Africa. So the question to me is always when we think about this: is where? have we gone wrong? And we've gone wrong not because we have deliberately said we don't want to learn our history. It is that sometimes in the educational systems we had, we've inherited them from Europe. So if you have an educational system that's been inherited, even if it's considered a good school, I put that in quotes, you know, you go, you went to the University of Ibadan, you went to uh, Makayari, um, you, you went to Dar es Salaam, you know, you, you went to... Uh, uh, you know, whatever, Foro Bay, you, wherever you go to school in Africa or in the African diaspora, if you go to school at HBCU, at Florida A&M, or you go to Talladega, or you go to Fisk, the question that I always have is, what are you studying? What's yes. the curriculum? What, why, ha why, why haven't we built curricula that really speaks to who we are. Why, why not base it on the literature of African people and African cultures? Mm -hmm. Why not base the philosophy on questions that have been raised uh, forever uh, out of the African soil and out of African people? We have raised these questions. Part of the problem, that's part of, part of, part of the problem is that the dis, um, orientation that has come because of our accepting of so much Eurocentrism mm -hmm. and, and sometimes uh, Pan-African, Pan-Arabism actually, that we are dislocated. We don't even know who, our, who we are. We can't even know, we don't even know our own names. We, mm -hmm. we, can't, we, we have, we know nothing. That's the, that's a problem. And that's because of war against Africa and against African consciousness, against African values, against African rituals. I, I, I saw a film today, just someone sent me a video and I was watching this video. There was a European, I don't know who he was, maybe an American, uh, taking uh, videos of uh, African uh, uh, dance performance. And he used the expression that, that you, we hear all the time, oh, they are dancing with frenzy and wildness. <laughs> Wait a minute. What what is what is wrong? What is wrong with us? Number one for accepting that. That's stupidity. That's ignorance. That's not understanding what he's seeing. He's looking at it, but for him, it is wow. It is disorganized. He doesn't understand the rhythms. It seems mm -hmm. to him they're just frenzy. This is insane. We we are responsible now that we know to prevent that, to stop that, to intervene with that to confront that whenever we see it. So that's my uh, my understanding of whether or not uh, we can be uh, Afrocentric without our history. Sometimes uh, it, it is the lack of our history 
that has created these problems for us because we don't know how to respond. If, if somebody says to us, what, what have Africans done, ever done? I mean, that's the question the Europeans ask. What, what have Africans ever done? Well, we, the first thing we ever did was we were the first people to name God. No other people named God before the Africans because Homo sapiens came from Africa. So there's nobody else. Nobody learned how to cross a river, a stream of water before Africans. Nobody built the pyramids before Africans. No, 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 nobody, nobody created a, 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 a masonry architecture before Africans. Nobody created writing as far as we know, particularly if we take the cave paintings uh, earlier than Africans. So, so what are you talking about? How, so what it means is that we have fallen into the trap that has been set by the enemies of Africa, who every time they get a chance, they're simply trying to degrade and diminish Africa. We, but, but again, if we don't know, we can't respond. We can't, uh, we have no argument, you see. It is very interesting, Prof, because I, oh, <laughs> I received, a, I think, three days ago, a picture from Africans. It's a, it's a choir group, a church group. And they were like, oh, Dr. Susan, you know, we follow your, your conversations and they're very interesting and we've learned a lot. And you see, we change our choir robes into Ooh. traditional African clothes. I mean, I'm just coming back to what you said. Right. And, Right. And you see, and they and they shared it, and they were like, Aha. and then I said, but you went to the church, the Catholic yeah, church. That's right. Well, and give them. They, well, 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 so, well, well, Dr. Tyler, here's what I say: one step at a time. So you know, it's yeah. not, you know, you, you you have to give them credit for choosing African fabric. The next next thing that you will discover is that they will they will even question then the church. They will begin to have other issues. They will say, well wait a minute, what did we do before there were churches? And we existed before the church. We existed before Christianity. We existed before Jesus Christ, before Muhammad, before Buddha. Imhotep, the greatest multidimensional human being in the ancient world, lived around 2,700 years before Jesus Christ. He was the first human who was deified and made a God, that is people, went to worship him at his temple. This is that black man. This is the first time. The first queen in the world who ruled was a woman named Sobeknefru. She was a black woman, the first one. There are, no, there are no queens before her that we know of, you see? So part of our problem, and you raise it when you ask the question about history, do we know our history? And really, we don't know it enough. And every school, whether it's an elementary school or a middle school or secondary high school, whatever, college, we have got to teach our history. And we've got to in insist that it be taught, even in the schools where they say, well, you know, uh, we don't teach that. We've got to insist. We've got to go to school board meetings and we've got to stand up and say, where is African history? Where is African studies? because it has to be there because you got, all, and sometimes you got school districts that are run by black people. Now look at this, you got school districts. I've been in several of them. I, I was, I was a boy, and I don't really know, I should name them, but I was in black school district and a school district that was run by black people, but they, they didn't want any history of culture talk. And so what do they do? That means they condemn our children to always be disoriented and dislocated and confused about the world. You got, the basic thing is to teach the right history, factual history. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, another issue, uh, uh, Prof, is the idea of like, even when we talk about teaching our history, and I, and I, I, I think we, we talked about it last time we had, I think, Professor mm -hmm. James on the show or something like, you know, if we even go into some details, when I take the example, I always take the example of the village that I grew in as a mm -hmm. child. Yes. And my mother or my parents were pastorals and they never went to school, mm -hmm. but they did business. Yes. My mother could calculate and educate us and everything. So when we talk about even these formulas of life, 
And I, I, I look back and I said, but we Africans, we don't need it. Because when even the fact that we say we need a curriculum, um, what is that curriculum going to be based on? Most of it is about how we do business, how we know other cultures, how we how we learn to love each other or to work together. But if you look at the African village and compound setup, those elements are just present without somebody having learned it or haven't done anything. How they deliver their children, what kind of medications or herbs they use, whatever thing they never went to school. How you on earth? <laughs> you're making my point. you're making my point. That's the Afrocentric way. I mean, you and and the village. I mean, they know how to teach children how to behave, how to act, how to count, how to calculate, uh, how how to relate to other human beings. These things, these things are in our history. They're in our culture. We we don't have to get that from anybody. We don't have to learn that from anybody. I just came from uh, Liberia. And when I was in Liberia, I, I said, all children, three and four years old working, they doing things, creating things. And so you say to yourself, why is it that we feel that somehow you got to teach children in a different way? But when I say curriculum, what I mean basically is that in the Western world, wherever we are in the Western world, and we could be in the Western world and be in, in the continent of Africa, actually, in some places, that what we've got to do then is to reevaluate the curriculum. And we have, yes. the, Dr. Dr. Nod Dove wrote a book called The Afrocentric School, A Blueprint. The, mm. Afro, uh, the Afrocentric School, A Blueprint, is based on her research in villages in Ghana. She just went to Ghana, went and talked to the women in the villages, several villages for a couple of years, talked to people, get information, and came back. She said, you know, the real basis for the Afrocentric school is found right in Africa in the villages. And that people think that it's somewhere else. No, it's in you, it's in us. We have it already. But we, 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 we like sometimes to minimize what we have achieved and who we are. And, and part of that is, again, this notion of formal education. My, neither yeah. my mother nor my father finished high school. So, so when you start thinking about that, you say, well, how did they raise you? What, well, it's because there are certain things that are passed on. Culture is really transmitted from generation to generation. And of, of course, what you want to do is to improve on certain things if they need to be improved upon. But a lot of things don't need to be improved upon, you see. Mm -hmm. um, another another thing, like you said, Prof, I'm just <laughs> align everything like we are the product from the village and we yes. all knew. And, and the most interesting thing is how the world saw us. It's just taking a case study to to portray the Eurocentric influence on our culture. So when we left the villages, and then we went into the rural areas or the urban cities to go to school. That's when the problems start. Yes. <laughs> when yes. you start even look at, at yourself, don't know yourself again. Yes. And you even, you, I mean, and then physically we even say, well, you know, this black color is, is not a good color. I mean, you never yes. thought about that when you're in the village. You know what I mean? Say, well, you're, you're dark complexion, so you're, you know, this is not good. Nobody ever said that in the village. Nobody ever told us that. But we got that. When we went to the, as you say, when we go somewhere else and then they began to put these values and these cultural ideas on us that we said, hey, wait a minute, uh, why is this? But we have, to, we, we, we have to teach our children to reject that. We have to reject it, I said. We have to be proud of who we are. We have to demonstrate the brilliance of our ancestors. And no, no ancestors are any greater than ours. No one ever thought any more than we have thought. And when people, excuse me just a minute, there seemed to be noise in my corridor. It's okay. Okay, I think it's going to be moving soon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But no one has ever thought any more. No one has ever created any more. And so the creativity and the, um, the ideas, uh, whether they are scientific ideas about the environment, whether there are ideas that come uh, uh, about uh, uh, spirituality, whatever. We have had all these ideas. 
we 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 we, th we knew these ideas and thought of these ideas long before anybody else. And because we had these ideas, we 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 know we know many things that work and things that don't work. I mean, the, the, the earliest diagnosis for diseases was really around uh, uh, over 2,500 years before Jesus Christ. When the Africans came up with diagnosis for hundreds of diseases and then therapies, interventions for those diseases, you see? So this, this is, a, these are facts. They, they're, not, they're not hidden facts. They are facts that we, if we don't know, we don't know. But they, they are, it's important for us to study our history and to know these things. Absolutely. Today we are commemorating uh, the week of uh, Martin Luther, uh, sorry, Malcolm X, and even all ancestors that have gone before us. If we look at it, like you said, of course we should learn. If we learn, then we would know how to do better. If you look at uh, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King or all the heroes that uh, Marcus Garvey, they were not all born in an African village like, like myself, but they grew up to study, to know their roots, to know what is it to be an African, particularly in a strange world. So absolutely the idea of us learning, even if we were not on the continent or brought up there, we have the genes in us, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, the thing with, with Malcolm, for example, I'm so happy that you brought up Malcolm X because uh, I, was, I was fortunate not to be able to talk with him, but I happened to be um, in uh, 1963 at the March on Washington, and there was a restaurant in uh, Washington, D.C. called the Florida Grill. It was not far from Howard University's campus at the time. And uh, he came in, and I saw him. And he was, of course, very gracious to all the people who were sitting there. I was just a student coming out of college, and uh, it was just wonderful to see him and to understand and appreciate the love that he had for African people. That is, to me, the central key to uh, our achievement. You have to at least, uh, the love, and the love is not a uh, artificial love. It's not like, okay, I need to love black people. No, it's not mm -hmm. like that. It is like, I recognize the harm, the harm, the injury that has been done to African men and women worldwide. I recognize that. And because I recognize that, my love for trying to do something to uplift all African people, wherever they are in the world, is so deep and abiding that I will give my life for that. That's the way I feel. And that's the way Malcolm felt. That's the energy that he gave. That's the energy that, uh, that Nelson Mandela had. It's the same energy. It is this idea, it's Winnie Mandela's energy, if you ask me. It's the same energy that Harriet Tubman had. And we're gonna be celebrating 200 years, we're gonna be celebrating uh, 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 Harriet Tubman this year. So it's extremely oh. important. Yeah, she, she'll be, uh, we'll be celebrating uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, actually, I think in April. So uh, and there's already a statue of Harriet Tubman, because Harriet Tubman's uh, death uh, uh, around 100 years ago was extremely important. So we have to begin to think about uh, history in that sense. So Malcolm, uh, Marcus Garvey, it's the same love, the same appreciation of African culture and seeing the condition, what had happened to us mentally, because it was not simply a situation that we were uh, persecuted physically, in which we were, but we were also persecuted in a very sad way, in a mental way, in a, in a, in a spiritual way. And that spiritual uh, pain and injury to us has been traumatic. And I see it in Africa. I see it when I go to South America, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Guyana, it's in Haiti, it's in Cuba, it's in Puerto Rico. It, it's, it's wherever African people are. It's in Europe and the United and UK. It, it's the same d disease that has been fostered upon us. And we have to fight against it. We have to be strong enough to fight against it. Love ourselves enough to fight against it. And love humanity enough to fight against it, okay? 
Thank you very much, Prof. Um, if we look, at, I really would be interested to know about that celebration uh, about our ancestors in April, but I'll get back to you on that so you can give us um, the date. And we're also going to do that um, in our calendar here because we have a structure where we think and exactly what you're saying, that we worship the gods of other civilization. It means... Yes. Um, we, we disregard our own gods and our own spirit. And we wonder why we actually don't even get that connection to get even the wisdom and the knowledge and the information that we've left in that transition. So um, remembering them, commemorating them, paying tribute to them, talking about their legacies, talking about their work, actually is that illuminating spirit and connectivity that we think we should have. So I, I really will be happy to have that date well, and we can do the same here. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a national uh, celebration. She was born in 1822 uh, and, and she died, uh, or rather she, she, she um, um, uh, yeah, was born in uh, 1822. And now 2022 will be this, the 200th year, the bicentennial of her mm -hmm. birth. That's what it is. And people are celebrating around the country, and I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not. I don't even know where you are, uh, Dr. Tata, which which city you're in or which place you're in. But it <laughs> is uh, you. You're everywhere. But but the, <laughs> but the point is that this celebration of Harriet Tubman should be everywhere, and we should look it up. I mean, from uh, the time of her birth, uh, they they assume it's sometime in April because nobody knew exactly the date. But people are going to be celebrating her in April of 2022. 20, uh, 1822 was a significant year because you know that was also the year that uh, um, the uh, Africans uh, who were the free free people in the United States left the United States to go to Liberia. I want to say this because I need to say this and I thank you for this platform because uh, the American Liberians have been maligned a lot by a lot of people. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I probably said some things about the American Liberians, uh, particularly the fact that I felt uh, often that uh, they didn't necessarily understand uh, how to relate to the indigenous people when they went to Liberia. But I, I just came from Liberia for the first time and I understood now the nuances of, of that whole experience. And here's what I wanna say to the public, mm -hmm. that uh, we, we, we owe a great debt uh, to the so-called American Liberians. They were actually free black people living in Philadelphia and Baltimore and New York City. Uh, some of them who had escaped to freedom in the Northern part of the United States to who, who decided they wanted to go back to Africa. And you have to think that this was a courageous kind of thing. Uh, wow. Africans had been in the United States for 200 years from 1619 so this is 1822. They mm -hmm. decided, look, I'm out of here. I'm going to get out of here. I'm getting out of this condition in America. I'm, I'm a free person. And of course, they were aided by white people who said, well, you know, we won't get black people out because these uh, free black people are just agitating for the release of the enslaved. So these people, 86 of them, took a ship, the Elizabeth, and went to Africa. The courage that that had to be and to take for people who probably never been on a ship before, never been mm -hmm. across the ocean, at, you know, I mean, and since the coming of their ancestors generations before, go to a place, establish that place, build houses, build shelter, and then began an interaction of trade with the indigenous people. There's, there's, a, there's some heroics in that. That's not of course. negative, you know? And I think sometimes yeah. when I talk to people, people talk to me and they say, well, you know, but the American Liberians did this and the very So I say, yes, they made many mistakes. But in the end, when you go to Liberia now, the country is 95% indigenous and only about 5% of the uh, American Liberians, uh, you know, are there. So so it's a, it's a complicated situation. But of course, democracy rules and democracy now has given the indigenous people the upper hand and that's the way it should be. But I just want people to know that that doesn't mean that you have to throw the experience of American Liberians under the bus. 
and say, you know, these were bad people. They were not bad people. They were people who did the best they could with the knowledge they had, and they didn't have much knowledge. Um, I think this is a case study that we we really have to talk about because it's That's also right. in, the, in the essence of education. Because I think if we take that case study to see what were the challenges that they went through, I don't even call it mistakes or anything because mm -hmm. imagine us, imagine us. I mean, I'm an African migrant. I'm not an indigenous mm -hmm. diaspora. I'm a migrant mm -hmm. from the continent. Mm -hmm. I've been in Europe for 23 and over years. Even mm -hmm. when I go back to, to the mm -hmm. continent, it's different. Can you just mm -hmm. imagine I grew up there and I came, had another experience, and then mm -hmm. go back. Things mm -hmm. have, they would never be the same. The way they regard me also on the continent is like, oh, you're European. My mom is always shy to you. Why are you always walking us if you have a problem with somebody? So mm -hmm. um, then imagine people who went through trauma. Yes. Who were, who were and th these are already people that were already sick so they were coming back to heal and i think that problem is the problem of the indigenous on the continent not mm -hmm. having an understanding about us in the diaspora and us but those are all inherited systems like we said this is the disease mm -hmm. that both of us are contaminated so mm -hmm. i think we really would still study mm -hmm. that african librarian i don't even know why they call them american uh, uh, librarians. Like, i don't either that's a very you are you are making my you are right on target. That's exactly the point I'm making. We 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 don't know enough about each other, and this is why what they are doing. And the reason I was over there is because the University of Liberia is setting up a center for migration and diaspora, and this is the first one on the continent of Africa where they're going to try to understand the idea of the diasporas and the migrants, people coming and going in Africa. And it's, a, it's, a, it's already funded and set up by the University of Liberia. And I think it's a beautiful thing, but you're right. We don't know enough. We need to interrogate you. These are cases that we need to look at and understand. And then we can point out and say, you know what? If they had done such and such, it would have been better. Had they done yeah. such and such, it would have been. But on both sides, because Remember that the reason that the Africans left the Americas, uh, America, United States, to go to Liberia was not to set up a nation. They didn't set up the nation until 1847. They left in 1822, but they didn't set up a nation until 1847. And the reason they set up the nation in 1847 was because the British wanted to take them over and, and make them a colony. And they said, oh, no, we're free. We are not a colony. So therefore, they declared themselves that we're gonna be a nation to keep the British from coming in and trying to take them over. So I I I had a I have a different I I I you know I know I recognize the class problems and the the problems of miseducation on the part of the uh the the Africans who came back from the US uh they had problems because the only education they had or knew was what they had experienced in the United States, which was negative toward Africans. And they probably yeah. took that. They, they felt they were civilizing the indigenous people, you know? And they didn't realize that they were not civilizing them, but that's what they had been taught in America. You go to Africa and you bring Christianity, you bring new civilization and so forth. So on both sides, you had some uh, misunderstandings and some real problems that we had to deal with. So, we and they also, while they were there, one other, point, other thing they did, they rescued other Africans who were in slave ships because slavery had been outlawed and they had to rescue African people who were coming from other places. Okay, so that was the thing that had to happen, okay? We, we are doing the same thing, Baba. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. whether it was in that 2022, or, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that period or this period, now it's even worse. Mm -hmm. It's even worse because if you look at exactly, that's the point why you think when we all these systems, they use mm -hmm. us now, you know, like the face of the African that is just black, but you have mm -hmm. to carry their projects and take it back to the continent in the name of, I came to the civilization and I yes. learned something. I want to teach yeah. you better. And that's yeah. why our problem is, and we do it every day, even now, it's every even more day. worse. 
than, than giving those ones. So I think that project could help us a lot because the essence of teaching, we've yes. never mastered that. Number two, yeah. I also have a system of, we have to, to, to agree and accept that we have been different it on mm -hmm. the continent or mm -hmm. in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if we are even calling our diaspora homes, do we have the infrastructures? Do we have the integration programs? Do we have the centers where we actually kind of like, you know, like we have to reintegrate again? Of yes. course. Yes. When of I go course. to Cameroon, I don't even know how to cross roads yes. again or these yes. motorbikes or, you know, yes. but we are not putting those infrastructure, the first thing before the others. And we expect people to just go back and mingle yes. and just become themselves. It's not going to work, Prof. That's right. But, but, but that's a study. Those are the case studies that we have to make. And we have we can do that. We're capable of doing it. We have yes. we have so many intelligent people and so many skills and so much creativity that those are the things that we need to do. And that's what we ought to be studying as the universities. We don't need to be studying some uh, uh, Fishing in Norway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, come on. We got we got things right here that we can examine and, and we can come up with ideas and, and and we will do it. It is coming because one of the things that happened, the reason as again that I, I was in Liberia last week was because the uh, Liberian guy heard me on another Zoom. The, the president, the vice president of the university heard me on another Zoom and he said, you know, your suggestion that there needs to be uh, universities in Africa that have diaspora studies, much like you have African studies in the U.S. He said, that's Correct. a good idea. And we want to do that in Liberia. So so that's why he invited me to come to speak at the university and to launch this center for a diaspora and migration. But these this is the way we grow we we create new things we don't have to wait for europe to give us an example or the arabs or the indians to give us an example of the chinese we we got all the answers that we need we we got all the intelligence that we need to say this is a problem hey let me give you another story the, the quick story because you know so so we have a problem with transportation in in in, in monrovia to me mm -hmm. it's one of the worst tra problems it maybe it's is second to Nigeria, this trans Lagos, the transportation problem. But we got urban planners. We got African people from all over the continent of Africa, from Cameroon, from Congo, from South Africa, from Kenya, from United States. We got African people from Jamaica, everywhere who are urban planners. Why can't we, why can't we solve the problem of transportation without having the Chinese come? That doesn't make any sense to me. But maybe somebody can explain that to me. So maybe, I'm sure some politician will be able to explain that to me. <laughs> what is that? What's, what's the problem here? And the only problem I can see is, again, what Malcolm X had, the love of the people. I want, I want that to be the best I way. I want the people there to live the best. Why do you have to put up with hours of traffic when you can resolve that problem? E even Tommy Sankara, one of the things that Tommy Sankara was interested in doing, he said, look, okay, we may not have the money, but we can get uh, we can get thousands of people to build the roads. We can build our own roads. We can get thousands of people to build a road. What is what is so you know difficult about that that we cannot have and we got and we got road builders all over the african world i used to live next door to a brother who did nothing but build roads for the state of california so you got we got all this talent but we have never we have never said let's turn this to our own interest you see and so what it means what it means it keeps creating situations where our children see they used to see the european but now they see the chinese as smarter than we are and that's not, that's ridiculous. That's not that's not the case. But what does it look like to a four or five year old kid who sees a Chinese managing a project going on in uh, Liberia or Guinea that Africans could manage? That's mm. not the problem, you see. Prof, 
Um, we are so, so thankful that we have you, the biggest world-class African scholars and experts. And I think, and I, we keep saying it, this is the biggest opportunity. Everything seems to work in our favor. And like you said, when we sit and ask these questions, I always like to go back to the village model mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. when we go back to that village model, we will build Africa. For instance, you grow up in the village. In this village, people develop their roads to go to the farms. They build their bridges, right? Where they cross over the road. They fish from their fish ponds or their rivers. Yes, you know, the water. So if we take this, this they don't rely on any, because in the village level, they are still more in the level of our kingdoms, our original state of being us. And so, you know, mm -hmm. even when we, we had some of these projects or water projects coming into the village, really, they were chunks of money and so they built, you know, this kind of portable water. To be honest with you, those projects die within, even on completion. Mm -hmm. Because the village people went back to their village, mm -hmm. to their stream, carry their water. And it was like, okay, a, a pillar just standing there. Because they used yeah. to doing their things without having aid or begging for anything. Yes. That is, you, you are so right. Hello? 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 Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes. So, <laughs> yes. Well, I have just a few more minutes, but go right ahead. Okay. Um, yes, so I think we were talking about the 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 age or, or the the culture of the village yeah the if village. We, so, so, we don't see ourselves inferior yes that model thank you it, the one of the things about the village i had uh, years ago a student who's now a professor uh who came to me and uh she had uh, actually she was from nigeria and uh her language was Ijo, and she had um uh, left her a village at a very early age, maybe in her teens, and had gone to Switzerland to live with her brother or her uncle. And uh, she then left there and came to the U.S. and went to college, uh, got a B.A. degree from a good school and came to Philadelphia and got a Ph.D. and became a professor. And she said, um, after she had been in one of my classes, she, she was so struck by the idea of Afrocentricity, that she said she she wanted to go home to visit her mother. And she said, she, she told her mother, when she got home, she says, mother, I would like to go and see the ancient shrine of our clan, of our family, where, where our family had the first clan. And she said her mother broke down in tears and started to cry and said, I thought I had lost my daughter. When you went to Switzerland and the United States, I thought I had lost you. I thought you would come back as a European woman, 
didn't have anything to do with it. She says when she went to the shrine, she came back so strong because she felt that for the first time she had accepted herself as a village person from that particular village. And so it, it, to me, it made me cry. I was like, wow, that's a powerful story. But we all have to do that. I have to do that when I go back to Georgia. You know, I go back to Georgia in, in the South, the deep South, and go where my great grand my great great grandmother lived. And I go to the place like I went to the place two years ago where they they lynched, where the white people lynched my uh, niece's uh, great great grandmother in, in Georgia. They they lynched they 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 killed her, uh, split her stomach open, took took the fetus out threw it on the ground and stomped it to death. That was in Georgia. I, I go to that place. I go and I see that place because it allows me to know what I'm fighting for and who I am, you see. We have to do this. If we don't do this, we become fluff. We become inauthentic. So these are the things. So. Being from the village, go to the village, speak to the people. They'll be happy to see you. You know that. They'll be, you know, you, you, you represent something to them, you see, and for them. So anyway, I just wanted to just say that. Thank you very much, Prof. I think, you see, when you speak like that about your great-grand, great-great-grand or your mm -hmm. ancestors and that mm -hmm. you went there, so that village is everywhere. It mustn't yeah. be the village on the continent, the village where your ancestors were, That's right there, right. where they were lynched, where they were killed. That's and right. I think it doesn't matter how we're going to, maybe sometimes we would have to talk this story oh. to the earth so that when we cry, maybe we can become human. Maybe we can yeah. feel all that again. Yes. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Prof, I know that you have just an hour with us here. Um, what is the way forward? I mean, I want really to hear a little thing about African politicians and African politics and the Afrocentric. Did you discuss something with the prof in South Africa? How are we going? How is it going to look like in future? Are we well, going I, to I, here's, here's what I, you know, I'm a Pan-Africanist. And I always have believed that it's very strongly that Africa must unite. I really do. I, I think that the only way forward is that way. And the reason that I'm saying that is because right now, one of the great dangers is what uh, some of the uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah and Sheikh Joe, um, they, uh, they understood that what is happening throughout the continent is that there are bilateral agreements being made between African nations and nations in Europe and America and in and, and Asia. And those bilateral agreements, for example, if Guinea makes an agreement with, uh, with China, and if Congo makes an agreement with Britain, or if uh, Zimbabwe makes an agreement with Korea, these are bilateral agreements. And what these bilateral agreements do is that they complicate matters so that those particular African nation states are not able to move toward each other because mm -hmm. each one is tied up with some foreign uh, entity that has control over the resources in the African countries. Zimbabwe, they said, for example, has thousands of acres that are under agricultural development, but not for Zimbabwe, but for China. So the Chinese are there, but they have thousands of acres that they are farming in order to send uh, the product, not to Zimbabwe, but to send the product out of the country. So these kinds of arrangements complicate things. And that's why we were hurt. We, were, we, we wanted in 2004 and 2005 to have a United States of Africa. That was a big thing in the AU. This is one of the reasons I believe Gaddafi was killed. He believed in that. He, he, he spoke on it several times. I heard him speak on it. And this was a powerful movement that wh why not have a United States of Africa, which would be not, uh, if Africa were one country, it would not be a, a poor country. It would be one of the richest countries in the world. 
if you had Africa as one country with one foreign policy, then the various nations in the world could not play one nation against another. You could not go to Senegal and say, well, you know, I'll get, I, I want to invest in your country, but I can only give you 25% of what I make. And if Senegal says, no, that's not enough, then you say, well, then I'm going to go to Guinea and I'll get it from Guinea. You, 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 we need one foreign policy. We need Africa to have one currency, the Afro. We need one passport, which says Africa. We, we, we ought to be able to go, you know, from Cameroon, if we want to, all the way to Uganda with just that pass with the African passport. But, but what we have, we have leaders sometimes who are thinking only of their own individual power. And I can say this because I was fortunate to be with a president that I thought at the time, and I still believe, at the time was one of the wisest men in Africa. And that was, I was a consultant with uh, Abdullah Awad uh, of Senegal, the president of Senegal. And uh, I went with his delegation and foreign minister to Abuja to a meeting with uh, uh, President Obasanjo and a small delegation of the uh, African Union that was a subcommittee to discuss the unit unifying Africa. And, and, and I gave a small talk, but in that um, meeting, I could see the impossibility of the situation because mm -hmm. all of them agreed, yes, we need to do this. This has to happen. The future of Africa is the United States of Africa. We got to unite all these, all these nations and so on. And the one person that I admired most at that time was uh, Abdullah Awad because uh, the old man got up and he said, if we could do this tomorrow, I would gladly become the governor of Senegal. I don't need to be president. I can be a governor. I don't have to be president of Africa, but we need to do this. We have to do this to have one, one major country with all of the militaries combined into one military to defend Africa. We need to have one banking system for to develop the continent. So he was speaking very passionately. Of course, um, you know, uh, we, we didn't, uh, even though I appreciated his intellectual thinking, I think he got confused later in his career where he wanted to run for another term and, 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 and that became a problem. But, uh, but overall, he was the only one. And I mean, and I had other people there that I know uh, I mean, uh, uh, Tabo and Becky said, yes, this will have to happen, but it's not now. We can't do it now. Um, the, the, that time, the president of Ethiopia, Melis Zanawi, he said, yes, uh, we, we, we have to do this, but we can't do it in Ethiopia right now and so forth. Um, and the question of that uh, Kofi Azuma asked, uh, I think that Nana Adu is doing a pretty good job in Ghana. I mean, I think that he's made some good statements. I'm not uh, so sure. I'm not close to him. I don't know all that he has done, but uh, I have seen him on uh, Zoom and on videos, and he's made some wonderful steps toward the diaspora. And uh, Nana Adu uh, has to be given uh, credit for that. I mean, he has to be seen in the light of uh, uh, a Pan-Africanist. He's made some very strong statements about colonial structures and about uh, Europe, uh, at, you know, trying to dominate Ghana and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I do explain that. If you, uh, yeah, <laughs> somebody's re reading one of my books, uh, Sekou Kela. Uh, yeah, uh, the book, uh, the, the notion of Njia is actually, the word Njia is the word from uh, Kiswahili. And it simply means the way. And it was a little book that I wrote about 40 years ago. So that's where NGA comes from. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Good. So um, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Um, you, you said something very pertinent. I also do think that, like it's, it's not. A I'm sorry. I do think that it's a process. It's not a walk in the park for all of them to dismantle these structures. But one thing that I do think also is uh, has a lot to do with that ego and greed 
Because mm -hmm. even if they make these bilateral agreements, um, uh, they, 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 they do sign and do get loans and do get monies or what. If they would only maybe put it back into the government, into the agriculture, into the sec uh, private sector where they can create jobs, do you think that would be a problem that we're working together with China or Europe or anything? It, would, it wouldn't be a major problem to work with any nation so long as we were doing the honest thing. I mean, you take a country like Gabon. Gabon is probably the richest country in the world per capita. If you take the money that is produced in Gabon and you were to average that money out to, to the citizens of Gabon, the, the people would be the richest people in the world per capita. The mm. problem is greed. And the problem is that you don't have leaders in Africa, enough leaders in Africa, I say, who feel a sense of patriotism for their brothers and sisters. How could you live in a country like Gabon, which is one of the most productive countries in terms of oil in the world, and have all of the wealth of Gabon and just hold it for your family or a few families in your government? You can't do that. That's not correct. It's not moral. It's not ethical. It's certainly not African. It's not an African value. <laughs> value. Now, someone wants to get me into trouble. <laughs> I can't. I can't. You know. And uh, the only thing I can say is that um, I sat on the beach in Cameroon for four hours in a in a powerful ritual. Uh, around uh, uh, Bimbia, because Bimbia, yes. most people don't know Bimbia. Bimbia is one of the uh, most uh, powerful historic sites uh, in the world, uh, particularly for the slave trade. And you, you go there and you come through those forests and you think about it. It was an incredible situation. So Bimbia, we pray to the ancestors always when we go there. But uh, but no, the political situation in Cameroon has to be uh, one that's challenging. It's extremely challenging. And many people have been harmed and hurt. I mean, that's all I can say. And uh, it, it is, uh, you know, when you when you stay too long, sometimes it's a problem. So we need, just really need to to consider that. So that's what I would say about that issue. Correct. Um it's wonderful, wonderful startup with you here. And we, uh, like the scholars, we are putting up this kind of lectures with professors um, that would be focused on authors, writers, pre-colonial African history. Because Thank we you. think if we begin to study, like Chuck uh, Antadeop and all the other professors who wrote about each other, what was the ethics of family and culture and identity? Yes. What was the use of our kingdoms and our land? Mm -hmm. How did we manage our stories? How did we manage population and growth and economy? How did we do business? How did we trade, yes. trade yes. with one another, even without those currencies at the time? How yes, come Mansa Munsa, how could Mansa Munsa sell gold in, and then his own people? You know, those are all pre-colonial history that yes, we want to that we really want to work with professors like you and to do something extraordinary than just entertainment or talking about story or the stories and our people, all of us scattered in the world. How do we know about that? Or the biography like you, Prof. People have read mm -hmm. your book, I've read your book, but do I know your biography? You know, because when we don't know their biography, we don't know the things yes. that they went through, like you say. We wouldn't even appreciate who would read your stories. I'm like, oh, it's a great right. professor. But what about your bi biography? Yes, yes, yes. So, well, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I wrote a memoir as I run toward Africa, and mm -hmm. I am now finishing a second one, uh, which is uh, going to be out hopefully next year. So, uh, and people can read about those difficulties and so forth. I would also suggest, uh, you know, just uh, publicly that. Uh, someone like Kimani Nehusi, who is actually a successor to uh, uh, Sheikh Anta Jope and uh, Teofil Obenga in a way, in terms of uh, the ancient Egyptian culture. He teaches ancient Egyptian language here at Temple for us. Uh, he would be someone to be fascinating to have 
on this program. And also uh, Dr. Nadav, who I told you about the book, Afrocentric School. Uh, yes. she's, she, she's also here. These are major, major people that ought to be heard uh, by your audience. And, uh, and my new book, which is also with Nadav, is called Being Human Being. Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse is the subtitle, Transforming the Race Discourse. And I urge your viewers to go out and uh, to just order that book. It's on Amazon. You can get it anytime. Being Human Being uh, by Malefi Asante and Nada. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tata. Thank you. I'll be reaching out to you to get all your books and your literatures because, like I said, we're starting out with a black library on the Pan African okay. Daily. So when we bring you professors, then we relate and send our viewers to buy because a lot of them are asking those books, even on the continent. So I'll reach out to okay. you on that. Thank you very I thank much. Thank you very much. It's my honor and my pleasure. Honorable. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. So um, it is a very, very wonderful pleasure that we had um, Professor Asante here for the first time. And uh, I want to thank you for your patience, um, even though we're having some interruptions with, you know, the connection, the Internet and whatever, you know. And I, I saw you in the chat when you were struggling to say, Professor, go on. You know, the Queen would come back. Just go on. Just talk. But he couldn't hear you <laughs> because he's only connected to us. He couldn't hear you. So. Yes, but I mean, it was a start. And I want to give a shout out to my advisor and uh, my mentor and a facilitator who has just jumped into a team to say, I, I, I can't, but I could be a hub in the background to really research on the professors and the scholars and the experts that we need in our communities, both on the continent and in the diaspora, so that we can start this work of teaching and consultancy and knowing about their books, their biographies, talking to them while they are still here, right? So I am thanking our elder brother, Jume Faye. I call him Baba Jume, Professor Jume. He doesn't like to be given a title anyway, but that's who he is. So Professor Jume is actually my advisor on the Pan-African Daily TV and the structure that we're putting out there. I mean, uh, Professor James and Leona Jeffries and all of them, they're already into that list like we told you. You keep asking, what is the way forward? What are we going to be doing? It is not just ending here. We take all the recommendations that you said. We need to call this a chemistic or whatever, but it is already in that. And we'll be launching very, very soon, uh, probably at the end of this month, we'll be launching that initiatives where we are going to actually focus on the pre-colonial history. If we don't do that, there is no way we can begin to say, oh, we have to know our history. We have to teach our history. We have to correct our curriculum. We're already just talking about it, but we have to get into those essence. When we talk about authors and book and we take Chuck Antia Dog, or we take Professor, um, all of them, Molifi that is coming here. Leona Jefferson gave us already a list. Professor James Small, uh, Mama Bello, all of these great inventors. And so when we start reading, because those books were read from a, and we start combining, when we say all the time is. Oh, we're connecting Africans on the continent and the ones in the diaspora. So what? Connecting how? Why even? So, but we're addressing exactly that need. And uh, you all know we are a global family. You're all a part of this conversation. And so you can begin to already sort out your position. Who? I'm a philanthropist. I'm a consultant. And I am a journalist. So what is your own position? We establish and the role that we, our global community is the Africa we want global. That's our community. And we are encouraging all of you to, to, to take a membership on that community. That's a community. That's a community of us worldwide. Profits, individuals, nonprofits, corporate, whatever. That's our community as a family, a global family. But what we're talking about here, this structure, is get our scholars and experts.
part. It's always say, oh, you know, oh, they did this to us. Oh, they miseducated us. Let's start educating ourselves. And I think we can never do that correct, that role of pre-colonial history. But it doesn't also mean, imply that we're going to completely erase the modern history. Remember, we're already so infested in it. What we're trying to do is if you don't know your past, in the kind of a middle because we're in the middle we we have the three i, I call it the three generations. it's not we are not three generations but i call it the past the present and we are the present now and so we have to dig into the past to be able to fix the present and give it over to the future it's as simple as that so of course we're going to write all these books and systems and what on oh africa need this no africa needs just to know who were you before you came to me. Who was I? Somebody taught me something else. And absolutely, it's not even wrong if you teach me something. But what is the problem that I just forget who I am just to learn your own? That's where the nuance is. So in not share to say, it's really going to be impossible to, for us to say, we're going to eradicate the, the structures on this. And I think those were some of the mistakes that uh, our freedom for thinking that that we're talking about. Sometimes let us look at really the feasibility. Is it feasible that we really would just become one? Yes, if we want it, it's gonna happen. Now, it takes a time to build those structures and, and you know, put the structures that we need. We're not also going to sit and say, oh, a diaspora, a diaspora, a diaspora went through this and this and that. And the diaspora, like, oh, the continent, the continent, oh, you've been backward, you are not this, no. It is all, we're just turning around like in a pot, melting pot, just turning around, dancing, dancing. When one falls, they gather talk and cry like we are on the Malcolm X week today. Remembering our ancestors is connecting back to their work. And do you know he's right here with us? And that spirit brings us the invention. And that's the knowledge. That's the education. That's knowing our history, which was just how many years ago. But now we threw it. We study about every other person. Oh, we're doing thing and asking different results. It was invented by this. Oh, you know, um, uh, the, the wheel that keeps turning was invented by this. Now, but we want to know who are our inventors? What did they invent? As a matter of fact. And how come we could have... Is some, oh, you know, they came and they did this to us. And every time we keep saying it. So James, want even me. Last time on the show, you heard that. We need to stop this lazy talking. That's what we call lazy talking. Um, we need to go back to work and we are on it. So tomorrow, the topic is going to be who killed Malcolm X? Who? Oh, we've been reading his books, his quote talks. Sometimes it's really nice to know what happened. Who killed them? Why? Maybe it's not really, but who killed an elder? And this elder was there. Elder has stories to tell us. We can cry. We can carry our, head, our hands on the head. We will, we will do it. Remember, we're learning. It is about teaching, knowledge. It's not about arguing or who was there, who was not there. Um, like we know the Christians are way to fight you. Jesus wasn't there, but I believe. I wasn't there, but I believe that it happened. So, yeah, we might not have been there in the times of everything, but we do believe, right? But now we have people that went. They're not going to show the nails on their hands, but they saw it. And we are so opportune, to, like I said, for us at this time, African people, we, everything is just working for our good. Nature science discoveries technology us connecting our voices just being a light now everything works perfectly for us this is our time so when we keep saying awake 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 it's not just a word ask yourself why why are we using only this word if we keep saying unity 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 it's not just a word why do you use unity oh we must unite now oh we must be awake why are some words coming to us so 
Our ancestors, when we remember them, call them, they begin to awaken us and they give us this word. Remember unity, 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 connection, connection, work together, love yourself, right? It, 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 it might sound like just talking about some words. Talk about your stories. And one other thing we're going to start connecting is, I mean, I've been making some discoveries in the last time. I also sit back when we have our days off. I'm not just lazy or just doing something or cooking or playing around with the boys or something like that or going in my garden or something. No, but I, I really take time also to see the development and the involvement uh, of Africans in this whole thing. Amazing. It is just amazing. That's why I say a lot of things are working for us. It's just us, nothing else. Nobody else matters, but just us. I mean, if you see the kind of TikTok videos, the, 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 the kind of, you know, normal videos, Africans on the continent, even in the village, just know I can put my camera, go my Android phone, and I'm live. And I talk those stories. And I say, it's so incredible. What are we looking for? And they do it exactly the way we're saying. Tell us stories from our own point of view. And some of it I love. They do it in pidgin. They do it in their dialect. They do it. They show they had they cook their food and stuff like that. That is the education we are talking about. That is the classroom. That is a whole somebody that just sacrificed, sat there, and was like I watch a video. And this this young girl, I think she's a nurse, that was advising women to 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 not stop breastfeeding their their kids and giving their breasts to their husbands, thinking that they want to secure the marriages. Can you imagine? I mean, it was. I laughed, and, but it was so educational and so powerful. So the way she put it, <laughs> the way she put it, it, it sound like entertainment, but because she did it in an African narrative, and she was like, oh, I'm in the clinic every day and you bring so children, you carry them, they're so, uh, you know, they, they don't have weight like our own African powerful because you're not giving uh, breast milk to these children and you want to serve it because you want to say, oh, no, I want to serve my husband, you know, go out for a side chick, but they're going to go anyway. And it's even nice to just send them, let them go. Our men were always grown to just go and they come back when they want to come back. You know, so imagine a girl a little nurse putting out a story about breastfeeding in a very, people will say unprofessional, primitive, local, and whatever. But I'm telling you, these are the content creators that we're talking about. Not just content, but historians. They don't need to be scholars or do some research. But she's just telling you everything that she experienced at her clinic in her local village and warning the girls and the mothers. And say, don't, that breast belong to that child. He has to grow up. Oh, I can't breastfeed my child now. Because no, I have to, you <laughs> right? So, yes, it is interesting. It's very, very interesting. We have to keep on the spirit. We have to build and we have to educate one another. So join us tomorrow. It's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. Who killed Malcolm EX? We know there are documentaries out there. People have done, I've watched a lot of documentaries on that. But imagine somebody that was there. He also did documentaries and wrote books on it. But he's still with us today, an elder, elder, elder. So we are going to be live again tomorrow on this conversation, yeah, with the brother. And Professor James also would be here. And he's still trying also to connect to us. So we're going to see how many speakers we're going to have on the Malcolm X week, right? But do your own research. Remember him. Remember all the ancestors that we go, that we're going to hit us. Read their works. Why are we remembering them? Because they leave legacies. But what are the legacies? What is it that they taught us that we're not doing, that we forgot? All right. So thank you so much, my beloved. Thank you, sisters, brothers. Leo, I see you. Zuma, Cherry, Gail, Johnny Boy, <laughs> Alice Williams, <laughs> Kwame, Kwame, thank you. I mean, I think you you should be. I saw you posting a lot also on this conversation. I don't know whether you want to be uh, part of the conversation this week. I don't know. Yep. Let me know. Ayoka Efwa, my name. <laughs> we call it in Cameroon, my Mbombo. We are the Efwas, the Fridays, remember. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Yes. Um, who again? I'm trying to see if I miss somebody. Paul Brown, brother. Thank you so much. You say hi, Susan Tata. Hi, 
how to CV Stevie Stevie Robinson. Thank you so very much. And I thank such of uh, some of you who actually addressed the questions and you saw he answered them. Um, but the question of Cameron was a little bit kind of hard uh, for him. But he did mention where he was and he thinks actually it's a it's a problem out there. And when that everything is just being normal again. So yes, find it out for yourself, reach out for information, educate yourself, share petitions that we keep sharing in our groups and we see how things get better. Elizabeth Lady, thank you. You said Sankofa, Lady or Lady? Sorry if I don't pronounce it well. Um, yes, thank you, Sister Sinovia. Thank you, Queen. You said we need to know. Thank you so much. We're putting out that structure out there. And you know, you are, and Leo and Sherry are one of our biggest fundraisers and volunteers. You've already volunteered for that. We're just putting the necessary structures for you so that we can work with on that. Yeah. So I see Kofi saying uh, Kevin Tyler is on YouTube right now. So when we're closing from here, I think you can join to watch um that program out there and give us also feedback i want to thank you adukuye and ga you were watching from facebook all of you that are watching from facebook platforms i see your numbers and i see some of you that are commenting in the chat i want to thank you so much for watching the pan-african daily tv stay in touch with us a lot is coming and a lot more interesting and serious like you know it's not just about entertainment we're teaching we we we, we we're working we're building a nation, okay? So thank you for every support. Um, Senuti, thank you, Ikebun. I was wondering, I didn't see you today, Ikebun, but I see you were here already. I think I joined you late. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Ram Kansan, Aru K. M. Son was the one that asked the question on, uh, on Cameroon. Thank you so very much. I mean, we can know everything. That's why when you're here in the conversation, ask the global family, ask those questions when our professors to come up. What do you think about the situation? Is there something breaking somewhere that they don't know? Pull it out to them. Like we say, why do we keep repeating government? Oh, there's a coup d'etat here and this and this and this, but nothing changed. So one leader comes, it's going to go back to the same thing. Something has to change. And yeah, as leaders, or have to learn. We have to learn. We have to go back to know some, you know, basic informations and not forget. Mr. Caveman, only a known human will fight with a gun. Luckily, we never created anyone. We had our bows and air arrows, and these bows and arrows in the villages, we went to set traps, you know, uh, catch beef, you know, oh my God, all sort of things. Uh, or, <laughs> or, <laughs> burn out the trees to get the honey or get the insects from the ground. We use all these tools just to build Africa. The vast land that was given to us by the creator and the homo sapiens, it means the original people. And these are questions we have to ask. How did we feed ourselves? And today we keep always saying, oh, Africa cannot feed itself. Who tells you that? Fat lie. <laughs> we just didn't go back to the way we were. How did we use, and even what kind of tools did we use to cultivate that land? How did the early man, we call them the primitive people, even invented just making fire by two stones? Who did that? How did we just, that we were the ones that could build a fire, put a three pot stone, only scratch, and there was fire. And someone wants to tell me what? And tell you what, and we do believe it, and we even preach it, and we fastly learn. We have to just go back and learn those things. African spiritualist, thank you, thank you, brother, sister. I know that community being here. Please, most of you that are also doing the work that we're doing, content creators on your YouTube channel, in your line, in your link in the chat, in the chat. Oh God your Facebook or your YouTube you doing the for for conscious for education for whatever to be you know we're all 
build a build a nation. So feel free to always drop your link here. Or if you know other YouTubers or traders that are doing the same work, not in a while, in a couple of minutes, then you could say, like Kofi said, Kevin Taylor is now on. And you join. All right. It's about sharing knowledge. Remember, we are people that share. We never do all this kind of selfish thing. Oh, it is Susan Tata's um, YouTube channel and platform. And this is, this. no, it is that. No, is it here? It's on the mirror. So feel free, feel free, brothers and sisters, to share your links here. Okay. I don't know, selling what or whatever. I'm never to come on something my job is to sit here and host the scholars and the age you also being a part of it okay so to say you were here kele seku kele african gods thank you majesty thank you her royal highness i don't know female male we never had agenda remember so if i say that also don't don't be annoyed Okay, we're one. <laughs> so, what else? After this small thing, a couple of days, and we are open on Tuesdays to Saturdays. Sometimes when we guests, have guests, we rebroadcast. Sometimes when we can't come because of technical issues, we rebroadcast. Sometimes when our uh, Post them and make it very fast. We are here when we are all of them. And even the skills, remember the conversation with John subscribe. You need to interest. So that's okay. Yes, search simple. You for being here. Um, I know that's the email of Professor Asante who was Blackout as usual tomorrow. I don't know what is going You are watching the Pan African Daily TV African with Day. Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want unity, consciousness, our culture our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan-African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.